let's go ahead and pray and get into God's word. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we give you glory. You are our God and King, and we've gathered here to worship you. And Lord, we got to do just that. We got to worship you in song. We worship you with our finances. And now we worship you by the preaching and teaching of your word. I pray that it would impact each of us, that there would be moments within this message that would resonate with us, that would cause us to change if we need to change, or maybe even for some, to draw them into a relationship with you for the very first time. So we praise you. We give these next few minutes to you. Help us to be undistracted and to focus on what you want to say to each of us in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. So we're rounding the corner. We're almost to the end of this series that we've been doing on Romans. And we've been in this series for quite some time. We've only got a few weeks left, so it's actually going to be over at the end of August. And we're going to be kicking into a new message series about kind of the heroes of the faith. And I'm excited about that one as well. So just a few weeks left. But maybe you did not get one of the Roman study guides. Even if you didn't get to follow along with us all that much during this time, you could still go back and watch those past messages and go deeper into the Word. So if you're a guest and would like a copy of that study guide, simply raise your hand up real high. One of the ushers would be more than happy to bring you one of those. And if not, we're going to be projecting the uh, verses on the screens in just a moment. So my goal for today, there's a couple things I want to do. Typically, what I usually do, we're going to read from Scripture, and then after we read from that, we're going to give a little commentary about what we read. We're going to talk about a little bit of the theology surrounding whatever that Scripture might be. We're going to go through some current events that relate back to what we're reading in Scripture today, and then hopefully by the end, we're going to find some things that we might apply in our own lives that we could take from here and go apply as we go about the course of this week. So we're in Romans chapter 14 today. So if you have your Bibles with you today, you could turn right there or watch on the screens as I shared or even on the Journey Church app. Romans 14 starting in verse 1. Maybe before that, if you're new, as we've gone through the book of Romans, you know, Paul makes this case in the early chapters that, hey, we all fall short of the glory of God, that we are all sinners. How many of that does it mean? All, right? So every one of us, he makes this case for Jesus Christ, the one who forgives us of all sins, saves us, and rescues us. And now in these later chapters, he's kind of telling us how we might live as believers that might be different from the world, that when they see us, the way that we live, the way that we act, the way that we interact would resonate with a lost and hurting world, drawing them into a relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Roman 14, 1. As for the one who is weak in the faith, welcome him, but do not quarrel over opinions. Do you guys see any quarreling over opinions, maybe online or anything lately? Do you guys see any of that going on at all in our generation? None of you? Just me? Some of you are laughing. So it seems like there's a lot of quarreling going on. It seems like there's a lot of opinions being shared. It seems like we live in a bit of an age of rage. And whether that's in person or online, people seem to be not as nice as they used to be. Has anybody ever noticed that, right? It seems like some craziness is going on. Now, as you'll see in a few moments, he's going to really redirect this thought more towards religious opinions, but it's not exclusive to that, I think. And when we bring it full circle in just a few moments to the end, I'd plant this seed even now. Are your opinions inhibiting others from growing in their walk with Christ or coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Are we willing to sacrifice for the love of our brothers and sisters in Christ, even if that means we give up some of our liberties with the hope that they would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So we live in this cancel culture. We live in this age of rage. We live in this age of opinions. But guess what? When all this chaos that you see going on, has anybody noticed any chaos out there, right? Be it You know, one thing after another, doesn't it seem like anybody ready for 2020 to move to 2021 just yet, right, with some of these? I mean, it just started with a bang, and it's gone on, and if it's not political chaos, it's COVID-19 chaos, it's racial chaos, it's whatever it might be. I mean, the craziness that is out there right now, let me tell you something, it all has one source. Even how many of you have been, anybody been paying attention to any of these conspiracy theories lately? Any conspiracy? My family better raise their hands because I've seen them talking about it in the group chat of late, right? So, you know, maybe half of that stuff is true. It could be. A lot of that stuff could be true. 
But let me tell you where the real source behind all of that is. It's none other than the devil himself living out his mission statement before us in our day and age, attempting to create chaos, attempting to divide people. If you read Romans 10, or, um, John 10.10, 10, I think this is a bit of his mission statement. It says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, right? So he's living that out in our generation. And when we fall prey to it, when we fall into it, when we continue to build up those kinds of things, then guess what? We're playing right into his hands, And man, has he been active in this year, has he not? That just tells me that he's a little bit more fearful that Jesus is coming soon, right? So what are we called to do? For those of you who were here last week, I hope you enjoyed Bishop. Man, Bishop Jones did an incredible job. He reminded us that we are part of the army of the Lord, that we are to be warriors in this generation, loving God with all our heart, strength, soul, and mind, and going out there and making a difference This is a time for serious Christianity. Can I get an amen? If you combine verses like John 10.10 with sections of Scripture like Matthew 24, starting in verse 3, it says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, speaking of Jesus, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and for the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom will rise against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and these are but the beginning of the birth pain. As I preached this during first service, somebody came up to me and there was a headline that there was an earthquake in Tennessee, right, while I was preaching the message a little bit earlier. It wasn't my fault. Thank you, Lord, right? It wasn't my fault. But we're seeing these things in a more rapid fashion. So I would share my opinion that we are in this season where it describes at the end there that we find ourselves in the birth pang season before Jesus returns, right? So you see these different things going on that are these chaotic things that the spirit behind them are those demonic spirits that are being sent out by none other than the devil to foment pain, to foment difficulty, to foment change, to keep us off of what we should be focusing on, right? We should be focusing on the gospel. So when it comes to sharing our opinions, sometimes we better off keeping them to ourselves if it would hurt others or keep them from knowing Jesus as their Savior or distract them from the things that really matter. We elevate certain things in our lives up to idol status when we shouldn't. And he'll explore a couple of those in Scripture in just a second. But how many of these things are already starting to come true? You think of this season of wars and rumors of wars, right? We're in constant war all the time all around the world. The U.S. alone, discounting all of the other countries that are there, guess what? Trump was elected a number of years ago, and what did he say? I'm going to get us out of Afghanistan. I'm going to get us out of um, Iraq. Has he been able to? Not yet. I don't know if that's his fault. I don't know if it's Congress's fault. I don't know whose fault it is. I'm not going to cause any judgment on any of those. But these endless wars persist all the time. And then there's the war of terror, right? That terror war ain't never going to go away. Have you ever seen the war of terror thing, right? It's been going on for 20 years now in our generation. We still have troops that are positioned all around the world. Now, I'm still a patriot, but I'm going to call out stuff. I don't care if it's Republican, if it's Democrat, if it's whatever, right? When it's not right, we need to share some things. And guess what? There doesn't need to be wars and rumors of wars all around the world all the time led by us if we're truly a Christian nation, right? Amen? Hallelujah? But don't we elevate our politicians to political status? No offense to any of the ones who are in the room right now. (laughs) But uh, Mary Leadenleitner said, The world needs the church and every person within it to set aside political idolatry so that people can see our risen Lord. And right now, man, you go online and and you go out in interactions. And even at the local level, man, I'm telling you that these people are vicious. They stab each other in the back over political issues. I think of people that are running for office that are very good people that are here amongst us today and the attacks that I've seen online against them. These are local elections. Could you imagine what happens at the presidential state and things like that? Oh, my goodness. But here's one thing I also know. Four years from now, there's going to be different faces running for office up there in Washington. And guess what? The challenges are going to be the same, right? There's going to be difficulties, and I pray that it would one day change, but I shared this in first service because Charlie was here, and 
it, it reminded me of something that he and I had a conversation over breakfast in Middleburg. I remember exactly where it was. That, what's that little restaurant called? Black Creek Cafe. Come on, go, go, go out to Black Creek Cafe in Middleburg if you ever get the chance. And we're sitting there for breakfast that day, and we're talking about some of the issues inside of politics. And one of the challenges that he brought up, he goes, you know, my dad was elected to the legislature at the Florida um, level, and he was, one of the big things he campaigned on is he wanted to make a difference in abortion. He wanted to, um, you know, restrict abortion. He wanted to make a change. He believed in that cause. And while he was running for election, everybody around him was like, man, if you get in there and you put forth the bill, we will support you in that. We will be excited for you. We will stand behind you. You go for that, Mr. Van Zant, right? And then he got elected on that platform, and guess what? He went forth and he wrote that bill, and he tried to get some people to co-sign it, and how many of them co-signed it, Charlie? He's saying zero. <laughs> Why is that? It's the deeper issue. Politicians, sadly, at times, don't ever want to solve the issue because there's too money, much money involved in it. So what do I mean by that? So if you're of the anti-abortion camp, that means that all the money that flows to anti-abortion stuff is going to go to you. And if you're of the pro-abortion camp, then all the pro-abortion people give you the money. Why do you, think they always, why do you think they always bring up the NRA and gun control every time you get around to the fact that there's an election coming up, right? Because the people that are pro-guns will go give money, and then the people that are anti-guns go get money. But how many laws ever actually change? Don't put your life and your livestock in politics, that's not what this life is about. It's about Jesus Christ. Don't let it be an idol for you. Don't get stuck watching Fox News for too long. It will rot your brain. All that stuff will. Lord, would you help us? We live in this age of rage. People punching each other over wearing a face mask or not wearing a face mask. You've seen that video too? Romans 14.2. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Now, isn't it weird that Paul said, while the weak person eats only vegetables? I mean, it looks like he was interjecting his opinion. Darn vegans, come on, help us, right? No. If you're a vegetarian or vegan, we love you, I assure you. I am just teasing, right? But he's bringing out these issues that were relevant to the day. Not, not, so he's really starting to shift gears here talking about religious issues because the Jewish people had religious issues surrounding everything, what they could eat, um, what they could do on the Sabbath or not do on the Sabbath, um, when, when they could do anything, just about anything that they did. They had created a bunch of man-made laws that they added to Scripture that they tried to apply in their lives that allowed them to never live up to what God was really calling them to. And sadly, many of those things still occur even in our own generation. Let me read on and then I'll comment. Romans 14, 4. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's before his own master that he stands or falls and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day better than another while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes the honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So what are some of the current religious issues that we see that continue to manifest and surface both in person and online? Believe it or not, the one that he mentions still is something that I see people constantly debating online being what day of the week should one person worship? Should we worship on a Saturday or should we worship on a Sunday? Being that you're here on Sunday, I guess you're in the Sunday camp. I don't know. We're, we're glad you're here this morning. Um, but that, that was a real issue for them in that time. If someone wanted to worship on a different day, man, it, it's sacrilegious. You can't do that. That is absolute heresy. You can't worship on a different day. You must worship on Saturday. Yet Paul is bringing forth something new to them that day. He's saying, guess what? It's not so much about Saturday. It's about the spirit of the Sabbath and the spirit behind what we're talking about here, right? So Paul brings this up. So in our day and age, there are a lot of pagan type things that have infiltrated their way into the church, if I'm honest with you. And one of them, believe it or not, is the worship on Sundays. So Sunday worship, do you know what Sunday stands for? 
It's the worship of Ra, the sun god, the worship of the sun god. So Sunday was the day that they set aside to worship the sun god, trying to falsely worship the sun god instead of the son of God. Does that make sense, right? So what happened is in Roman times in those days, they set that as the official day of worship. And even the way in which we preach and the way in which we conduct services has its root in Greek culture and Roman culture to a large degree. The very fact that I'm standing up here preaching to an audience, so to speak, came in some of those roots. Now, a lot of these things have become part of the culture for good or for bad. Maybe some of them should be abandoned, right? And other things we should keep or we should redeem. So part of that with Sunday is he's saying every day should be a day of worship, right? You are created to worship God each and every day. The bigger principle than whether you worship on Saturday or worship on Sunday is that you set a time aside as a Sabbath, a time to rest, a time to focus on God. And in our generation, let me tell you something, Sunday morning in America is kind of the official time to worship. We had a Saturday night service for a number of years here. We did everything that we could under even the best of times free COVID to get about 125 to 150 people to show up to that service. We op- And then rarely, that was mostly believers that would come to the Saturday night service. Once we opened up Sunday morning services, I think it just exploded and we had people from all over, unbelievers, believers showing up and becoming a part of the fellowship. So in our culture, I think people, including the unbelievers, often expect that church is going to happen on a Sunday morning, right? So we need to adapt and be able to reach people wherever they're at. Do you know a lot of people actually work on Sunday mornings in our culture, right? Then we have these beautiful expressions of church that happen almost every night of the week. Some churches have worship services on Wednesday and Thursday. There's home groups, there's home churches, all kinds of beautiful expressions to reach people each and every day of the week. Aren't you glad, right? Let's look at some other things. Every day is a day of worship, but you think of opinions that could cause problems and cause challenges and can be debated online. You know, how many of you have heard of the old stories of people leaving the church over of the color of the carpet? Anybody ever heard that one back in the day, right? We just removed all the carpet so y'all can't fight over it. You know, we just said no, no carpet color. But I'll be honest, even in our church, there were people who left the church because we got that screen. They're like, you got that screen? and you prioritized it over kids' church. We think kids' church should be the thing that you should go and and do. And since you bought the screen, we're leaving the church. They should have just waited six months. They would have had kids' church and they would have had the screen. You know, it would have all worked out, you know. But people go and come to churches or set their lives around these opinions that have nothing to do with Scripture. They have nothing to do with the foundations of the Word. Let us not be so lax in the decision-making that we have. Are you called to a place? Are you sent to a place? Might we fight over the things that are worth fighting over, the core, the gospel, creation, fall, rescue, restoration, glorification, not over other things that are fringe that don't really matter. Another big one that seems to be captivating a lot of people online right now is if if you worship, if your church sings Bethel worship songs, then you are of the devil. How many of you have seen that online? Anybody seen the Bethel stuff? Okay, good. A lot of people have seen it. I guess you're still here, so you must feel that we're not of the devil just yet. But let's talk about that. I happen to be old enough, thank you, Jesus, that I remember what it used to be like in the early 80s and and 90s when they had the contemporary worship wars. So what happened at that particular season was this. Um, A lot of churches were coming out with contemporary worship music for the first time versus hymns. And a lot of the people that were used to hymns and the tradition of hymns were like, those new churches that are worshiping with, with video and worshiping with lights and worshiping with these new songs, they are of the devil. 30 years later, you know, a lot of people are worshiping in churches that have lights and have worship songs and have contemporary worship. Guess what? There's nothing wrong with either. There's nothing wrong. It's a personal preference. It's an opinion. It's a choice, right? You're choosing one style over another. Some like hymns, some like more contemporary worship. Praise God, praise God, praise God. That is awesome, right? And then you get a little bit deeper into the study, and the very people who are worried about the hymns, if you go back and read about the sources of a lot of the tunes that went along with the hymns, they actually came from old bar tunes about 100 plus years ago. So back when they were first introduced, those hymns, everybody said, you can't play that music, it originated in a bar, right? And they fought over it. 
And they're doing the same thing in our generation, and they're criticizing people like Bethel. But Bethel, the pastor at Bethel, has some jacked up theology. How do you know that? Have you talked to him? Have you gone out there and heard? Well, I read it on the internet. Everything's true on the internet, isn't it? I've seen people that really haven't taken time to research because I've heard a lot of the stuff that the guy teaches, and there's a lot of sound stuff there. And maybe some stuff in our cancel culture, you want to take one or two things that they took out of context, and then you want to go blast the whole thing and say that you shouldn't be singing it. Some beautiful worship has come out of that place. And guess what? Sometimes, and I'm not saying this is the case, God even uses donkeys to bring glory to himself, does he not? So if God creates some amazing music that comes through a place that's not perfect, guess what? None of us are perfect. The second you walked in here, our church went to pot. Come on, you know. (laughs) We're all jacked up. Lord, help us. I need to move on. Oh, wait, I got two more I want to pick on before I do. Any King James only people in the house today? Any King James only people in the house? One. Two, hallelujah. Do I hear three? Come on. We had a few in first service. Praise God if you like the King James. Amen. You know, but the King James ain't the gospel. I'm here to tell you right now, right? So you get some people even in our generation that are like King James only ardent people. They'll tell you if you use any other version of the Bible, it is not biblical. It is of the devil. And man, they will be very strong about that. Has anybody ever met one of those kind of people, right? In good conscience, you got to know that there's these things that came out called the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found and unearthed and uncovered. The fact that their God forbid heresy was a few errors that they did in the translation of the King James Version. Oh, my goodness. Most versions of the Bible came out with good intent. I'm not saying all did. But guess what? How many people have you heard walking around speaking King James English around you lately? If they do, you think they're kind of weird, don't you? I mean, especially where Charlie lives in Keystone. I live out there in Middleburg. People don't speak no King James out there. They speak country out there, you know. They have the country version of the Bible out there, right? Most newer versions were created with that explicit purpose of helping have a modern-day English translation that people could understand. Now, sometimes, I'll admit, every now and then, when it comes time to pray, do any of you do this? You revert back to King James prayers. You're like, hallelujah, Lord, thou, thou is the biggest of awesomest of gods and none of you. You never met somebody that did that? Oh, y'all haven't been around Christians for long enough. Come on, Jesus. Here's my last one. I rem- this was a true story. I was at a Bible study when I first came to Jacksonville, and um, we came from Miami. In Miami, it was really you were a Christian or you weren't a Christian, and there was not all that much in between, right? So there was not all these big theological debates that I encountered when we first came here to Jacksonville. And um, we were in a meeting, and people started getting very heated. So this side of the meeting was like, we're all pre-tribulation people. And this side of the meeting is all, we're post-trib people. So how many of you are pre-trib rapture people? Raise your hands. It's okay. Represent. If that's you, stand boldly. Come on, put your hand. Why are you putting it down? You're acting all insecure. So like, if you're post-tribulation people, raise your hand up. A lot of you don't know anything about what's going to happen in the end times, apparently. Like, you're just keeping your hands down. So these people are literally like going to blows, fighting over pre-trib, post-trib. And this one pastor stands up and he goes, I'm pan-trib. They said, what the heck? Everybody looked at him like, what are you talking about? It's all going to pan out in the end when we get there. Come on. (laughs) I don't say that to say that God varies in his word. His words are true. His words are succinct. They are 100% authentic. There is no error in what God spoke. But in our humanity, at times we make mistakes and comes to different conclusions about things, right? Is it any reason to fight over our opinions on these things if they're not crucial to the faith? Or in doing so, might we create more damage to others? Romans 14, 7. For none of us lives to himself, and if none dies to himself, for if we live, we live unto the Lord, and if we die, we die unto the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For this Christ died and lived again that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. 
Why do you pass judgment on your brother, or why do you despise your brother? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We don't need to do the judging. We don't need to have the liberty to share our opinions at times that better are left unsaid if it will bring more glory to the King of kings and Lord of lords. How many people do we turn off by our opinions when we could turn them on by sharing with them how much God loves us and how much God changed us and how much God transformed us? One of my old pastors, it was the life verse of their church, Matthew 6, said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What if we were a people who sought first the kingdom, who didn't judge others, who didn't worry about the things of the world, who didn't worry because evil will one day lose and the kingdom of God will reign forevermore. Hallelujah, Jesus, amen, amen, and amen. There's so much more important things to do. My final verse for today, Romans 14, 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide to never put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and I am persuaded in the Lord that Jesus, nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy for the one whom Christ has died. So let me put it this way to you. Are you a stumbling block to others by the way that you're living your life? Are your opinions or your actions potentially causing others to stumble? It's a real thing. It can really happen. When we idolize things like politics and elevate them to the level where we're fighting and coming to blows with people in person or online, that is not a good thing. It probably drives more people away from our cause than it does when we're focused on the things that really matter. Would you agree? So I got you one that you would agree. Let me give you one that you might not agree. What if I put one out there that a lot of Christians idolize and put to a pretty high status, and if I mention it, they often get very mad at me. What if I asked you to forego your liberty to drink for the sake of your brothers and sisters in Christ? How would you feel about that one? Well, Eric, I have the liberty to drink. The Bible says it's okay. I am allowed to drink alcohol in Jesus' name. It is not a sin. In fact, the things that he was talking about here were not a sin, were they? It wasn't. He says, you have the liberty to eat what you would like to eat. You have the liberty to drink what you would like to drink. But might we at times abstain from that liberty that we have, and it might not be alcohol, I'm using that as an example, but might we abstain from something like our opinions? Might we abstain from our anger? Might we abstain from gossip? Might we abstain from a number of things for the sake of our brothers and sisters in Christ? But if you take an issue like alcohol, a lot of people elevate that. Man, you try to tell them you probably shouldn't drink as a believer, they will get fired up, mad at you. Some of y'all are mad at me right now. I see your eyes. They're like, ah, zapping me, right? Earlier in the previous service, he didn't do it this service, uh, uh, David came up and gave me my 24-year sobriety chip. It was a blessing to be able to receive that from him. And hey... As a gratefully recovered alcoholic, I will be straight up. With you. Drinking alcohol not to excess is not a sin. It is not a sin. If you can do that, it is not a sin. We have liberty in that, right? But I have had people, and I think it's always a beautiful thing. My wife did this for me, and others have done it for brothers and sisters, where they said, hey, as a believer, as someone who loves you, as someone who wants to see others who are struggling not struggle, um, I would abstain from that which I have liberty in, in order to make a difference in someone else's lives. And they're real world consequences, huh? You need a chip too? We'll give you one. Um, I can remember a story that when we were talking about the sermon Mary Jo brought to remembrance, there was um, a lady who came to this church and her husband would never come with her. And we were like, man, we're praying for her husband. We're always praying for her husband. 
And she told us that he was caught in the midst of alcohol. He was caught in drugs. He was caught in pornography. There was a whole lifestyle that he had surrounded that. But at one time, that wasn't the case. She said he had recovered, and then he ended up going to another church. And at that particular church, the elders of that church felt it was okay to drink. They, they didn't have any problem with that liberty. And they invited him to a study, and uh, he came, and they were all drinking. And he was a, a person that was in recovery, and he tried having trouble processing this. He's like, oh, man, what do I do? And then he went back there a couple times, and he tried to process it, and he tried not to deal with it, and he tried to process it, and he tried not to deal with it. And ultimately, because they said and proclaimed by their actions in front of him, that they had this liberty, he went back and took a drink again, and it led him down the road. I don't know if he's even sober today, but at the time, it was like 10 plus years of him just going back into that lifestyle and really struggling through that lifestyle. And I can't tell you how many funerals I've done already. You know, in our culture, it's a little different than some other cultures where, you know, people go crazy um, and drink themselves to death. And alcoholism is a real problem. Drug addiction is a real problem. Um, so I, I do ask in that, like, it, what benefit does it do? If you take an issue like that, it might be a different one for you. My final one, kind of funny, I remember, I remember Molly used to work at Publix. I don't, I don't, she's in the back of the room now. Molly would work at Publix, and people would go through the line, and they'd come to the church, and then uh, they'd be with, like, their 24-pack of Budweiser, and they hit her line, and they're like, oh, no. <laughs> you know, like, Why do I have to have her check me out, you know, like, instead? But I say that jokingly, but I also think of those who might be struggling, and you might not even know it, and then you're walking through Publix, and they see you, and they're like, man, I saw them in church, and they're there. So, yes, this one's a little near and dear to my heart, and I'm not obsessive about it, but I have seen people raise this issue to, like, an idol status, where they, they're like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm standing on this liberty, and there are many other things like it that we do. So that might not be your thing, but maybe God's bringing something to your heart that you might need to let go of, that you might need to abstain from, that you might need to put to the side because it might cause another brother or sister to stumble. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the words of the Holy Spirit as spoken through Paul in the book of Romans chapter 14. He challenged us in the area of our opinions and whether it's wise to share them or not or knowing when to do so dutifully, to focus on the things that really matter and not get caught up into trivial religious arguments over things and escalate them to a place where it causes division amongst brothers. You challenged us in Scripture to abstain from things if we need to. In their case, it was food. In our case, it may be something else. So, Lord, as you search our hearts as we get ready to depart today, if there are things that are in our life that have come to remembrance, would you give us the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome them today? Would we repent from them? Would we renounce them? Would we seek your help and seek the hope that is found only in you? Would we be a people who focus on making a difference in the lives of others? Would we be known for that? Would we be a people who are known for going out there and sharing the love of Jesus Christ with everything that matters Every moment that we waste in these silly debates over silly issues detracts from our ability to see another come to know you, another come into the kingdom. Lord, would we focus on that which really matters? And if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but you feel him tugging at your heart right now, we would love to pray for you and with you, and I would encourage you. After this service, come on up to the front. I'll be here. Other leaders will be here. We'd love to join hands with you. We would love to pray with you. We would love to welcome you into the family of God. We'd love to give you some resources to help jumpstart your relationship with Jesus Christ. For the rest of us, would we leave this place and have an amazing week in Jesus. God bless you. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for being here.